Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Susie Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, have you ever been on the receiving end of an apology, or maybe you've offered an apology, but it just did not hit the mark? Have you ever been hurt? The person apologizes, but you don't feel like the issue's resolved. And maybe they said to you, hey, I said I was sorry. What's the deal? So what is the deal when it doesn't feel like the apology resolves the offense? What are we missing? Might we be holding on to the offense, nursing a grudge? Or could it be that that apology missed an important component that's necessary for healing? These are some of the things we'll address today with our good friend, Dr. Rob Reamer, who joins me every month to talk soul care. We're going to continue to draw from his amazing book, Soul Care, Seven Transformational Principles for a Healthy Soul. I literally just recommended this book a couple hours ago to a young couple we're working with. Let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. Dr. Rob Reamer's passion is to see the kingdom of God advance through spiritual renewal. Rob began Renewal International to assist pastors, leaders, and churches globally to equip the people of God to live in freedom in Christ and to walk in the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. His books incorporate lessons God taught him over the years through life, marriage, and ministry. Dr. Rob, welcome back to the show. Always fun to be with you, Susie. Well, you travel so much. The fact that you give us time always means the world to me, and I never want to take that for granted. So friends, always be praying that God would redeem the time that Dr. Rob gives to us. Appreciate it so much. And you've been on the show enough to know. I ask the same question every day, and it just I love this question because it really lends itself to the idea that God not only invites us into an intimate, thriving walk with Him, He wants us to talk with Him, and He wants to speak to us and impress things upon our hearts. So I know that intimacy with God is just one of your highest priorities. So given that, as you've been spending time with the Lord these days, what's he been talking to you about? So I'm going to set it up for you by telling you context. And um, this last month, August, I had somebody do five podcasts against me. What? Uh, Yeah, yeah, did a series against me and called me a false teacher and all this kind of stuff, you know, just attacks. So the funny part is the person said, you know, I'm not attacking. I'm like, I don't know. Usually if somebody calls me a false teacher, I would consider that an attack. <laughs> a little but, bit. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, given that context, yesterday was a retreat day for me. And as part of my retreat day, I spent time meditating on 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. Okay, so context. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 is talking about false apostles attacking him. And he's also just talking about his persecution, right? So he's been attacked all over the place, everywhere he goes, on the sea, on the land, in the city, in the country. He's been, you know, beaten and persecuted and imprisoned and all this stuff. And he's walking through that. And uh, he's talking about attacks. And he's talking about specific people persecuting and attacking him. Then you get to 2 Corinthians 12, and it's a very famous passage about the thorn in the flesh. Now, I believe the thorn in his flesh is actually the attacks, the persecution that's been coming against him. I say that for multiple reasons. Number one, that's the context of 2 Corinthians 11. Number two, the thorn in the flesh is used for Old Testament Israel's enemies. And so it's clearly a symbol that is used for enemies. And then um, Paul says, he calls it this. He says, you know, that... uh, God gave him this because God had given him this incredible vision. He had this encounter where he was lifted into the heavenlies, has this vision. Second Corinthians begins chapter 12 with this. And then he writes this. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited or too self-oriented, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. So first of all, it's a messenger from Satan. I think, again, it it goes with the verbal attacks, a message 
But second of all, it's from the enemy. He acknowledges that these attacks are from the enemy, but he also says that God is redeeming it in his life to keep him humble. And he says three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, Paul says he'll go on all the more to boast in his weakness so Christ's power might be perfected in him. So meditating on this because I'm, you know, just recently went through this. But when I look back at my life, Susie, you know, we talked about this before on the show, but I went through this long season of attacks that lasted for five years. And I mean, I had radio shows done against me. I was attacked on blogs, public spaces, and so on. And, uh, and then there's people in the church that sort of formed against me as well. And, and when that happened, uh, at the very beginning of those attacks, I went away to the monastery, and I'm laying on my face before the Lord, and I hear the Lord, and he says to me, because I just asked him why, not like, why me, poor me, but why is this happening? And the Lord said to me, I'm answering your prayer. And that day I said to the Lord, I don't know what I'm praying, but if you tell me, I promise I'll stop because this is yeah, how right. I had mine. And he's like, you've been praying for revival and you've been praying very specifically because of your study of revival, you know, Lord, give me the ability to impart your spirit uh, like the apostles, if my character and intimacy can sustain it. And he just said to me, this is mm-hmm. what it takes. But you look at Paul's life. He's had these incredible visions. He's seen amazing miracles. He's seen resurrections from the dead. The blind eyes opened, lame people walk, deaf people hear, demonized people delivered. His life is saturated with the supernatural. But part of what enabled him to walk with such power, authority, and anointing was the fact that he suffered so beautifully well. He would listen to the Lord and simply surrender to what God was forming in him. And so Paul could look at these attacks as though, in reality, they're messengers of Satan. They're evil, and yet he could see that God could redeem it and use it to allow him to be exposed for his weakness so Christ's power could be perfected. And for me personally, you know, my greatest weakness is the fear of not being loved. And the reality in my life has been that the marriage crisis, when Jen didn't love me anymore, we had that crisis that I went through that I talk about in soul care. And then the attacks where people were attacking me, and this last season of attacks, it's always exposing the weakness of the fear of not being loved. But it's only in your weakness that Christ's power can be perfected. And that, for me, was what I was meditating on this week, because I just went through it again and just thought, you know, I'm just going to linger with Paul for a bit and hang on to his words. And uh, it always results in me blessing those who curse me and then rejoicing in my weakness being exposed so that Christ's power can be more complete, more full, more realized within me. Somebody text me an amen, and let me know if that was a word that you needed to hear, because truly, we'll never be fully delivered from the fear of man until we are on the receiving end of of the meanness of men. You know, it's like seems like rejection actually thrusts us into a deeper understanding of Christ's acceptance. And I love this. Natasha from Wisconsin texted, and she said, she texted in Genesis uh, 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And you w- walking through what you did, you know, we've talked about it on past shows, years of of just slander and somebody asking you, I think several years into it, how are you doing with this? And you said, when I think of them, I feel only love. And you didn't get there overnight. You stewarded that no. pain in such a way. And, you know, I'm thinking two things here, Doc. One is, you know, in Scripture, I, I, if people have listened to this show for years, you know one of my things that makes me cringe is how quickly people throw around that term false teacher. And when I investigate yeah, yeah. When, when when we're doing this, it's often over secondary issues that there you can make a case for on either side. You know what I mean? Like mid trip, yeah, yeah. you know, pre trip or Calvinism, right. Arminianism. Yep. And to, to to disagree with someone and then call them a false teacher, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but in scripture, when it talks about wolves in sheep's clothing, they're wolves intending to divide and deceive the flock. They're not 
Christians, Christ followers, who may have a different view on certain topics than you do? What say you? Well, I would say false teachers in the New Testament are limited to three categories. Number one, they're saying a new gospel. So it's a gospel besides trusting Jesus for forgiveness. It's relying on works, etc. Number two, they are preaching one of the Trinity is not accurate in their estimation. So in other words, you know, Jesus isn't God, or they're preaching a different spirit, Paul says sometimes. Uh, So there's some sort of a miscommunication of one of the big three, the Trinity. And then third, uh, the person has spurious motives. The the teacher themselves may be preaching an accurate message, but their motive is false. Their motive mm. is to gain financial gain, or their motive is wow. to divide and conquer. And um, But those, that's the only time that I see in the New Testament that anyone's used for false teaching. By the way, in my new book, Authentic, I talk about that. And I lay that out because I think there is a ton of misuse, abuse, and overuse of this labeling, and it's yep. divisive in the body. So painful. And one other thing I want to say about that before we go to break is I've been mentioning, I've been slowly reading through uh, one of the uh, volumes of God's Generals. They're just biographies of saints of the past. And so far, I'm almost done with the, one of the volumes, without fail, every story of the saints of the past came under slander. It's, it was, I hate to call it friendly fire, but it was within the church. It was either jealousy yeah. or disagreement on the secondary theology, and the same kind of labels were leveled back then as they are now. But I got to say, there needs to be a fear of the Lord. You know, uh, Fan- Francis Frangipane said, you're not allowed to judge anybody that you're not willing to die for. And if you're not willing to die for them, at least are you willing to fast for them? Like, if you see something that you're concerned about— why wouldn't your first response be to fast and pray and intercede? If you see them making a difference in the kingdom, and you even think for a moment they're in error, what if you fasted, prayed, and sought God and interceded for them, and then listened to the Spirit of God? I mean, what might happen then? Absolutely. And you know, I, I, I think about the story of John Wesley. I don't know if you know this story, but Wesley would come to town sometimes, and people would climb in the trees to catch a glimpse of Wesley. The power of God at times was so strong on that man that literally people would fall out of the tree because they couldn't hang on. Like they would fall into jellyish state. You know, their body would become like jelly. A heaviness of God would come on and they'd fall out of the tree. So they'd have a caller go before John and just say, get out of the tree. John is coming, right? To keep people from falling out. And at the same time, there were people there throwing rocks at him because they considered him a false teacher. And it was church people and clergy and they're throwing rocks at this man that carries such a great sense of the anointing and God's power. Wow. So God allows it, but I do believe God will deal with it. And the measure you use will be used against you. And if you're not careful, if you're careless with attacking fellow believers, you will have to face God with that someday. So I pray that we can become better intercessors and be slower to accuse. Um, So as we pause here, we're going to come back and talk about the art of apology and why sometimes it doesn't hit the mark. Is it, are we missing it? Is the recipient missing it? Sometimes yes, sometimes yes. So Dr. Rob's got a lot to teach us about that. But I want to just say that God does still speak to us today. He He gives impressions to our heart. He speaks through His Word, sometimes through a worship song where He'll just give you an impression on your heart. So cultivate a listening life, because Jesus says, my sheep hear me. They know my voice. And hearing from the Lord is one of the greatest gifts uh, we could possibly have to walk intimately with God to the point that he puts impressions upon our heart. This is the way. Walk in it. What a treasure. What a gift. We're going to pause here. When we come back, we're going to talk about the art of apology. If you're brand new and starting a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you're just stumbled upon the dial and you don't have a relationship with the Lord to speak of, but you want, you got some questions, maybe you want to take those first steps, you can text the word FAITH to 41224 to get a conversation started just to help answer some of those questions. We will be back. Excuse me. We'll be back in just a minute. I don't know about you, but I love consistent nourishment. I love to fast on occasion. There's a purpose in that. But if you go too long without eating on a regular basis because you're too busy, your body actually goes into crisis mode. 
Well, in the same way, your soul, your spirit, they need nourishment too. And that's why it's so important to be listening to scripture, listening to good teaching on a consistent basis throughout the day. That's why we're here. We love what we do and we want to do it with you. If you listen on our on the radio on the terrestrial signal, we encourage you download our free faith radio app. That way, if you're traveling this season, you can take us with you wherever you go. You can catch the live shows or even the podcast after the fact. And we've made it easier than ever. All you have to do is text the word app to 877-933-2484 and then click the link. I hope you will walk with us on this journey. Greater things are yet to be done in and all around us because God, well, he's on the move. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. Boy, we had a just an amazing first part of our conversation with Dr. Rob Reamer. He joins me every month. We're always addressing some aspect of soul care. In a moment, we're going to get to the topic of the art of apology, but we opened with talking about the fear of man and when man comes against you, especially within the camp of Christianity, and they're leveling you know, slander at you, and yet it's so common to people who are really making a difference in the kingdom. And Nancy writes in, amen. She says, Proverbs 16 says, the fear of man is a snare. She said, ever see what a snare does to an animal? It catches a leg, hangs it up in midair where it fails itself until it passes out, then eventually dies. This drastically changed my perspective, allowing me to see others and myself through God's eyes and hear his voice and everything. Huge. What a joy to reflect him. Love to you, Nancy. Thank you for that. That's amazing. Okay, let's talk if we can about the art of an apology. And you explain it so well, and you've got a marriage video. I might have uh, Angie post that in our show notes. And it's really not just for marriage. It says thriving in marriage, but it's for any relationship, conflict resolution, dealing with our stuff. But anyway, you talk about if the offense is a 10 and the apology is a two, you're going to have unresolved hurt. So say more about that if you would. Yeah, so w- one of the things that I talk about is that you have to forgive someone to the level of the offense. Well, you also have to apologize to the level of the offense. So, for example, early on in our relationship, Jen and I had this one incident that took place. And truthfully, it's been so long, I don't remember exactly what it was. But what I remember was the early years of the marriage, she kept bringing it up, you know. And f- we got this marriage snag and one day, you know, she's, we're trying to sort it out. We're trying to clear the air. And one day I said to her, you know, you keep bringing up this issue. And I, I apologize. You say you forgive me, but, you know, you keep bringing it up. So we're not through it. I said, you got to help me understand. And she yelled at me. Now, my wife is not a yeller. Okay. So just the, that was like the first time I ever really heard her yell. So just that I realized like, oh, my gosh. Like on a scale of one to 10, I've been apologizing, but it's like I'm offering her like a a cup worth of apology for something that she considered like, you know, a 20 gallon offense or, you know, just a a huge bucket full of, of pain. And I realized my apology didn't match the hurt. And I literally dropped to my knees. And I cried and I said to her, I had no idea I hurt you that bad. Like, please forgive me. And, you know, she never brought it up again. Wow. And and that has been so long now. It's 25, 30 years ago in our marriage, probably probably closer, actually, to 32 years ago in our marriage that I don't even remember what it was. And we don't we never talked about it again because I finally apologized in a way that she could receive it. Wow. Well, how does a person learn to apologize in a way that addresses the offense, in a way that actually ministers healing? And and should both parties know at that moment? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the first thing I think is you have to learn how to listen differently. So in the beginning, I probably was able to listen for what I would call content listening, right? So I'm listening, you know, tell me what you're upset about. And she would tell me what she was upset about. Like, for example, you don't help enough around the house. And, you know, I'm not an idiot. I can tell her what she said. So what you're saying is you would like me to help more around the house. Got it. But then I'd help more around the house for a week or two. And then I'd go back into my old pattern. And, you know, we'd get right back in the same scrap. And the bottom line was I was hearing the content of what she was saying, but 
I hadn't yet learned the skill of what I would call emotional listening, which emotional listening is when I'm listening beyond the content for the level of importance to the person, the intent of their heart. I'm listening to their heart and soul cry. And so with Jen and I, what I began to realize was if she said something to me twice, I realized that I had missed the importance of it the first time. And I would look at her and say to her, you know what, this is the second time you brought this up. I realized that I heard what you said the first time, but I didn't really hear you at the level you feel this. So help me on a scale of one to 10, how important is this to you? And she would look at me and I would say, you got to be fair, because if everything's a 10, nothing is a 10. And if everything's a two, not, there's, you have to have differentiation. So be fair. Otherwise, I can't understand it. And she's like, well, this is like an eight, which for my wife is like, you know, giantly important. Right. And I'm like, OK, well, for me, this is like a two. So you have to help me understand why this is so important. And then I would ask her questions and try to drill down on why this mattered so much to her. That was emotional listening. Now I'm listening beyond content and I'm listening for intent. I'm listening for the, the heart's cry that's inside of her. And you know what? Here's the thing, Susie. Even if I didn't agree with her, she felt loved because she knew I was truly trying to understand her. And so it didn't always mean I had to end up in the same place that she did. I might not agree, but she knew I was really trying to understand her and she felt loved. You say sometimes we offer an apology too quickly. And of course you said it qualified. I'm not saying be slow to apologize, but if you offer too quickly, sometimes the motive behind that is I'm trying to rush through an uncomfortable situation yeah. and I just want to get out of it. Say more about that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, again, <laughs> we joked before the show, but so much of the lessons I've learned in life come from my own life and my mistakes, right? So she would bring something up, for example, in marriage, and I would feel uncomfortable. I'm, you know, I don't like conflict. Who likes conflict? You got to be a moron to like conflict, right? So I don't enjoy it, and I'm trying to get out from the conflict. So I'd apologize really quickly, but the problem was the apology – wasn't giving her time to express her hurt, her pain. I was offering way too often that cup worth of apology for a bucket worth of hurt, and it just wasn't working. And I realized what I was really doing was avoiding the light God was offering. And uh, God often offers us light to make us aware of things that are off in our soul, and he offers it to us so often through conflicted relationships. And even if the person is angry and everything they say is inaccurate or true, some often, so often, much of what they say is on point. There's something there for us to learn. But if we're defensive, we are blocking the light God offers and we're missing the opportunity to grow. And in my case, I often wasn't just defensive. I was that. But I also realized sometimes I was just too quick to apologize, and I hadn't really heard her heart, and I hadn't really resolved the issue. Can we also be too quick to forgive? And I know we're called to as believers, and I, I mean, we've done whole shows, and we've had focus on Forgiveness Month. Too many Christians are walking around with grudges in their heart. We're going to get to that in a moment. But I think about times when maybe you have a, a family member who's an addict who keeps offending, offending, offending. Yeah. Or you have somebody who's been like emotionally abusive in a in a friendship or relationship, and the first hint of softening, you feel uncomfortable and you feel bad for them, so you quickly rescue them and you forgive them, and they're they're you know the spirit of God hasn't had a chance to get all the way to the bottom, or the elevator hasn't gone to the bottom of the offense. Do you know what I'm saying? I totally do. And and so, listen, I'm with you. We have to be quick to forgive. We agree there. So right away, when I'm offended, I want to make sure I'm praying blessings and starting the process of forgiveness, even if the person never repents. But I think what happens is we're too quick to uh, move on without addressing the issue uh, at its core. And, you know, yeah, I want to forgive, but I also don't want you to continue to do this. 
You, you know, Paul says in Galatians 6, he says, you know, uh, you who are spiritual need to correct those who are caught in sin, okay? And he says, be careful not to be proud, uh, that you might, you know, be proud and judgmental of someone. But what he's saying is this. As a matter of fact, the context is carry one another's burdens. The burden he's actually talking about is not emotional pain. The burden he's referring to is unrepented of sin. He's saying, like, this sin, when you're caught in sin, it's like having a heavy load of rocks on your back, and it's squashing you. It's weighing you down, man, and you're having a hard time moving along in life. And what he's saying is we've got to be willing to go and address it. And so sometimes what I feel like is we lack courage to address issues that people need to have addressed in order for them to have breakthrough. And so we're sweeping it under the carpet so we, again, don't have to have uncomfortable conversations that people actually need to have a breakthrough. And we're too quick in that sense to move on without having the conversation that needs to be had in order for the breakthroughs to come. Yeah. And that's just important. I remember many, many years ago, there was a, a friend who just had turned and was just continually rude and accusatory. And I, I'm like, I would walk over and go, what happened? And she would spout and spew and I could never get to the bottom. It was months like this. Even saw her husband out in that, it was our old neighborhood. I'm like, what happened? And he said, oh, she'll have to talk with you. And eventually the Lord got a hold of her and she's, her heart started to soften. It was just the first beginnings of it. And I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. But, you know, it, I, I just didn't want her to feel uncomfortable, but I noticed her heart heartened immediately because I didn't give time to say, that was really hard not knowing for months <laughs> why you hated yeah. me, you know, and it right. was my codependence really of not wanting her to be uncomfortable because God was dealing with her. And I think it's important for us, you say it, you know, in all of your material, for us to have healthy relationships and to truly walk in intimacy with each other, we've got to have a good hold on our identity. We'll talk more about that on the other side of the break, but take a couple minutes and unpack that now. Well, I will just say that you hit something that's super important and connected to identity, and that's codependence. So Mm -hmm. uh, codependence ultimately is an identity issue. You lose sight of who you are. You lose track of your boundaries, where you begin, where you end, who you are, and you lose sight of the people around you and their boundaries. And so your boundaries get confused and you become enmeshed. And you begin to take responsibility for something that is someone else's responsibility. And this is one of the reasons why we are too quick to move on without having that hard conversation is because we feel uncomfortable. We're taking responsibility for this other person's life. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. And we're moving forward. But the reality is we're enabling the person to remain dysfunctional and broken. We're not helping them at all. And that is an identity issue. And ultimately, we were just talking about the fear of people, right? But a lot of that is tied to people pleasing. I want people to like me. I don't want people to be upset with me. And with codependency, there's always a need to be needed. You feel important when you get to help someone. You feel important when you get to rescue someone. So you love that position. I'm not talking about you, Susie, Mm -hmm. Uh, the person who's wrestling with codependency. When you're in that place, you feel important. You feel significant. You feel valuable. So you constantly get yourself in those relationships without having the full measure of truthful conversation. And they become enabling and the person can't break free and you get stuck in this codependent relationship. You know, I remember specifically in that moment, this was many, many, 20 something years ago, but I remember feeling profoundly convicted by the Holy Spirit that I had just gotten in the way of his process because of my discomfort. And I, that is what yeah. codependency does is you get in the way, you throw yourself You're in the path. You're right. Uh, yeah, from God doing the work and bringing the, you know, the conviction all the way to the bottom. Because I feel like there are times when the Spirit's bringing conviction, and if we try to throw a mattress or try to soften the blow or whatever, uh, we are going to keep them from the full transformation that God is after. And we need to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about identity. We're going to talk about something you teach on called transference. And also a listener said, what do you do with somebody you love so much, but they've offered a blanket apology? For example, I'm sorry for all the things I did to hurt you because I don't want you to hurt anymore, but they never get specific. I'll have Dr. Rob answer that as well. Dr. Rob Reamer is my guest. He joins us every 
every month to talk soul care. Specifically today, we're talking about the art of apology and how to get resolution and how to hold fast your identity in the middle of conflict because that's when the enemy comes in and tries to go after it. He's got amazing books out. We'll be drawing today from his book, Spiritual Authority and Soul Care. And we'll talk about his new one coming out next month, next month and the months coming after that, the new one. It, you might even be able to pre-order it on Amazon now. Authentic, cultivating authentic relationship and an authentic relationship with God. We'll be back with Dr. Rob Reamer in just a moment. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. Our good friend, Dr. Rob Reamer, joins us every month to talk soul care. Specifically today, we're talking about the art of apology, kind of codependence, holding fast your identity when you're in conflict. Earlier in the show, I mentioned the passage from Proverbs. The actual reference is 2925. The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. Another translation is the fear of man is a snare. The fear of God is safety and freedom. When you fear God, you don't have to fear anything else. Um, This listener texted in, Doc, said, Dr. Rob for president. So I just thought I should let you know in case in your spare time you Uh, want to get on the ticket. (laughs) (laughs) No, exactly. All righty. This listener said, what do you do with somebody you love so much who's offered you a blanket apology? For example, I'm sorry for all the things I did to hurt you. Then they just want me to not be hurt anymore by it. I don't know. I just don't know what to do sometimes because I think of it often. I think the person was only sorry because they got caught and they said, sorry for everything. Wow. What say you? Well, so first I'm going to, if that's me, I'm going to go and have a direct conversation with that person. And I'm going to be very specific about how I am hurt. So for example, if they've been speaking to me in a way that's critical and I feel hurt because of that, I'm going to give examples. I'm going to say, I feel like you're critical of me, for example, A, B, and C, and I give specific examples. Now, please hear me. This is really important, okay? When I go to have that conversation, I have gotten to the place in my point in my life where I realize I am the one that's prepared to have this difficult conversation. My spouse or whoever in this case, has not been readied or prepared for this conversation. So therefore, I have learned to anticipate a counterattack. In other words, I expect the person to be defensive or I expect the person to attack back. And that's because every one of us has insecurities. There's not one single person who doesn't have some insecurities, right? So their reflex reaction is to defend or counterattack. Now, because I've come to this conversation bringing what it is I'm hurt about, I anticipate the counterattack. And what I do is I've done my identity work coming in. I've secured my identity in Christ. I've secured myself into the love of God that I'm deeply loved. The issue of my value is settled at the cross. I want this person to love me. Even if they don't, I'm okay. Jesus loves me, and that's enough for me. And I go in anticipating the counterattack and... I make a decision before I go that when they counterattack, I will not defend myself. I will become the listener. And so I anticipate the counterattack. I get it. And then what I do is I listen very carefully with emotional listening. And I say, so what I hear you saying is start with content. Yes. And I make sure I get it. And then I own anything I can own and apologize for it. I'm very specific. And I give exactly the model that I want them to do. And then I go back to my point. I started by saying you were critical. I'd like to talk about that again. If they counter attack again, then I put up my hand and say, wait a second, please. Um, When I brought up this part that I feel like you're sometimes critical of me, you brought up X. I owned whatever I could own. That's all I want you to do. I'm not trying to attack you. I'm not trying to feel bad. I actually love you, and I want our relationship to be really good. So can you please just listen without defending and own anything you can own? And that sets them up to be able to listen, receive, and own what they can own. But you've also modeled what you want done. Hmm. 
So if that person never wants to talk specifics, they want to do a 30,000 foot flyover. So that's a two. And the person who's been hurt has got an eight. And that person who's offering the two is saying, I said, I was sorry. They really are at an impasse if they are not willing to go into yeah. the depths to say, we got to talk about some specifics here yep. because they're unresolved from so- it, right? What sadly happens then is you can forgive the person because you can always forgive someone unilaterally. You don't need the other person to apologize. Heck, the other person could be dead and you could still forgive them. That's a gift from God to us. Otherwise, you'd always be in bondage to another person's rebellious will. But you can forgive all by yourself, just with God. But sadly, you will have a very shallow relationship. The, the bridge of relational intimacy is the bridge of trust. And if a person doesn't own their part and they don't repent, then trust is damaged. And it can't be restored without repentance, without owning your part. And so what ends up happening is now you have this really weak bridge that can only sustain a very low weightiness of relational intimacy. And so you just don't trust the person, so you don't draw near. You you become a bit guarded with them. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit then about just the art of apology. There is the possibility of nursing a grudge where you're unwilling to forgive. You just kind of keep rehashing. Is that always an indicator of just unresolved hurt, or is there can there be kind of a rebellious pride in that? Sure, there can be. Absolutely. There can be pride. There can be unresolved hurt. Sometimes, Susie, I think it comes down to poor communication skills. So what ends up happening is I have an expectation of Jen, but I haven't actually communicated that expectation to her. And I'm getting hurt, but she has no idea that I'm hurt because I have an expectation and I haven't told her. And that's just unfair. And so now what ends up happening is I'm always hurt and holding a grudge for something that I expect her to do or something I expect her to be. But she doesn't even know that she's playing by these rules that I've never told her. So my job is to sort of get inside and figure out what I really expect and what it is that's hurting me. And then I need to be able to communicate that to her very clearly very lovingly and very kindly, but very directly and say, you know, this is what I really would expect. This is how I expect you would be able to treat me when we're having these particular conversations. And now she knows what I want. Now, if she refuses to meet my expectation, then I have to manage my expectations. See, at that point, I have to do what I call expectation management. And expectation management means, you know, I have expectation that she's going to do this thing. She says no. And I either now have the opportunity to hold that expectation, not give in to that expectation and constantly be hurt and have to constantly forgive or constantly be angry and constantly have to forgive. I have that or I can die to my expectation and, you know, death to self is often the pathway to freedom in life. Jesus said, you got to die to live. So at that point, I've expressed my expectation. She's not willing to meet my expectation. And the only thing I have left that I can do in order to live peaceably within my soul is to die to that expectation and um, meet her where she's willing to meet me. Mm. That's so painful. That's why some do live with a sense of brokenness. But what's so sad is, if things aren't being communicated, things can't be fixed. But you mentioned in your right. marriage video, you know, getting caught versus coming clean are two different things. You just have a few minutes before this last break. But like this dear one said, you know, this person was caught. And so you right. talked about in the video, that shatters trust because you didn't come clean because you felt convicted. You came clean because you got caught. And yeah, the and people sad, around you say, times- I didn't. Yeah, go ahead. Most of the times when people get caught, they're not repentant. That's why they got caught. If they had been repentant, they wouldn't have gotten caught. They would have come clean or they would have broken off the behavior. The fact that they get caught tells you they're not repentant. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying they can't become repentant. I'm saying currently they're not repentant. So this is one of those places where codependents often rush in and try to rescue instead of allowing someone to simmer 
in the discomfortable, uncomfortable environment of, hey, you got caught in this thing. We need to deal with this. Um, something's going on in your soul. What's underneath that? Let's get to that. And um, we don't like doing that sometimes, but that's what they need. You got to let them kind of get to the place where God works in their spirit, convicts them, and they come to what Paul calls godly sorrow instead of worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry you're upset with me. I'm sorry it's created tension in our relationship. It's all self-focused. I'm uncomfortable. I don't like it. Godly sorrow is always outward focused, not focused on self. I'm sorry I grieved your spirit, Lord, and I'm sorry I've hurt these people around me. And it's always other focused, but worldly sorrow is always self focused. Leads to death. And so, if you, as you mentioned in the video, and I want to say this here, if you're someone on the receiving end of you've been hurt because someone you love got caught, and you're wondering why does this hurt so bad, as you said in the video, the betrayal goes so much deeper and wider. Because they didn't come clean, they got caught. Yeah. And so it, the people around you trusted th- that person, trusted you. And um, so it, I'm just getting a sense that some are listening and you're feeling bad for feeling so bad. But there's just ripple effects to that kind of betrayal, isn't there? Yeah, and they need to reestablish trust. And the only way they're going to reestablish trust is to get honest. When I'm with a married couple and the man, let's say, in this case, went out and had an adulterous affair and then he got caught. And I just say when I sit down with that guy, I say to him, listen, you have one and exactly one chance to tell the entire story without leaving anything out. She gets to ask any questions she wants and you cannot tell a lie. You have severely betrayed trust and you got caught. So now if you spin it and make yourself better than you are, if you lie and get caught in lying, I'm telling you, your trust may never be restored again. So do not do it. If you want to save your marriage, you need to start getting really serious with God and start getting really honest with your wife. Okay, we're going to pause here. When we come back, I want you to answer this anonymous question, and we'll spend the last couple minutes, Lord willing, talking identity. But this dear one says, when do we go from managing expectations to being self-protective? For example, we don't want to expect anything because our expectations feel like they're never met. All right, when we come back, we'll address that one. Talking to Dr. Rob Reamer, not only about the art of apology, but conflict resolution and why sometimes we rush too quickly in when the convicting work of the Spirit is at work. And this is, I hope you hear me because we've talked about it plenty. As Christ followers, we have to work towards forgiveness, but there is a way to apologize. There's a process for forgiveness so that absolute trust and healing can be restored um, as best as possible. Dr. Rob Reamer is my guest, and we'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live, and I just have to pause, take a deep breath, and say thank you. With all my heart, thank you. You often hear me say, we can't do this without you, and we absolutely wouldn't want to. It's more important than ever that we be bold for Jesus, because we believe and know He's the hope of the earth, and you helped us do just that. So thank you for partnering with us so that we can partner with God to change the world. And if you've not given yet, you still have a chance to join us on this mission field. You can give now, safe and secure online at MyFaithRadio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, having a really rich conversation with our friend, Dr. Rob Reamer, who joins us every month to talk soul care. Today, we're talking about conflict resolution, the art of apology, when the apology hits the mark, when it misses the mark, whose fault is that? So much to learn from Dr. Rob today. Here is an anonymous question, Doc. When do we go from managing expectations to being self-protective? We don't want to expect anything because our expectations feel like they're never met. What do you say? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the things that has to happen when I truly die to self, see, when I'm self-protective, you hear the word self, I'm not dead to self. I'm not really trusting God's protection. I'm actually still self-protected. So when I'm with Jen and I want something from Jen and she's not willing to give it, I'm going to tell you that I am going to express myself to her. I'm going to be super direct. I'm going to make it very clear So she has a clear sense of what I'm asking for. 
And then I'm also willing when I do this, I am willing for her to say no. Why? So that I'm not manipulative, controlling and cajoling. See, that's about death to self. And then when she if she does say no, then I can't sulk. I can't pout. You see, if I'm sulking and pouting, that's my self-protection. And it's also manipulation. I can't withdraw and withhold love from her because, again, that would be self-protective. And I'm still making it too much about me. Listen, it is. But what if so it's hard. one-sided, Rob? We only have a couple minutes left. But this dear one wrote, since she's death to self time and time again, when the other person never genuinely apologizes, it's making me weary. If I'm honest, it makes it harder to love them the way I'm supposed to. What do you say? Yeah, so I want to be direct with the person like we talked about before in my approach. I model it. But at the end of the day, if you're with someone who will never apologize, never owns their stuff, you've done all the right things, what's going to end up happening is you're going to have a shallow relationship with that person. There's no way around it. I can't soft pedal it. You don't have trust with a person that won't own their stuff and never apologize. So what you're left with is a shallow relationship. That's what you're left with. So at that point, you want to probably get some professional help and you want to start talking about how can I create boundaries in this relationship where I'm not continually hurt, but my desire would be to be able to continue to move forward. Like if it's me in marriage, I don't want to bail on my wife. What I want to do is continue to have the conversation. We've used this before, Susie, but let me throw it out again because I think it's really important, right? You only have four tools to help someone change. You, you, you have to have a direct conversation. If it represents Jesus well, it should be full of truth, full of grace. So I do that, and then all I have left, if the person hears me, doesn't accept it, or isn't willing to change, all I have left is love, wait, and pray. I love them as they are, where they are, not where I wish they were. I wait for them to be open for another round of conversation. It's not like I never can have the conversation again. I wait for an open door, not one that I force open. It's not manipulative. It's not controlling. I wait, and I pray for that to happen, and I have to believe God. Now, hear me. Most of us are not willing to move into the love, wait, and pray, and we nag people. And we're actually trying to control people to get them to change rather than authentically waiting for God to move in someone's heart and trusting that he will. Wow. Wouldn't you say also just in the meantime, I'm thinking of a woman who just wrote in, I'm going to see if I have time to read her text. But when you're in that, where they're not willing to repent, not willing to apologize, flying 30,000 foot view, and you've tried again and again, you need to also care for your soul. You, you know, if you're in, of course. if you don't want to abandon that marriage, of course, you need to do some things, you know, how to cultivate rich friendships with, you know, other women you do. I'm talking to a wife here, um, right. do things that are good for your soul, right? You do. You need to make sure you're leaning into Jesus for healing. Yeah. Uh, you need to lean into Doing Jesus for love. Yeah. And you do need to have rich friendships. Yeah. That, I mean, I just know women who've had to do that. And uh, yeah. and somehow, some way, God meets them. We just have a moment left, but I got to read this. She says, holy smokes. He literally just told my story. This Her husband got caught again to make it seem better. He lied, then got caught again. I feel like the trust will never be restored. This has been going on for 10 years. And I have felt guilty for not getting over it. And now I understand why. So please tell him thanks. I'm so sorry, friend, for what you've walked through. Anything you want to comment on that, dear one? Yeah, just with you, Susie. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for a husband who has misrepresented the heart of God to you. Yeah. That's not the way the Father or Jesus is like. And I'm sorry for what you've had to suffer through. And I pray he will truly repent. Yeah. Yeah. We just have a minute left. Would you pray for her and others like her who are living in loveless relationships? Yeah. Lord, you know how much pain people are in relationally. And the truth is, Lord, uh, even people that are in a fairly decent relationship still have places that aren't quite what they want them to be relationally. Some of that, honestly, Jesus, is just the fact that we're on earth and we're in a broken, fallen, sin-stained world. And this world can never satisfy us. And we are born for another place. We are citizens of heaven, and the reality is only heaven will ultimately satisfy. So I pray on earth, while we're wrestling with these things that are painful, you would give us grace. 
Help us to forgive those who sin against us. Help us to be courageous and say things that need to be said. Help us to get inside our hearts and souls and be able to verbalize our true feelings and expectations and desires. And help us to do it without being defensive or nasty, which we can all be at times. Help us to represent you well to one another in relationship. And Lord, we need lots of help, courage, grace, and strength to navigate all this stuff. And I pray for all of us who have been hurt, that your healing hand would be upon our hearts. Jesus, You would bless us with your presence. For all of us who have betrayal that we need to work through, I pray we'd forgive and you would heal our hurt hearts. Yeah. And in all of this, Jesus, I pray your peace would rest upon us and your strength and help would be with us. In your name, Lord. amen. Oh, we love you, Rob. Thank you for the time. And friends, be praying for Rob as he's navigating more warfare as he serves in the kingdom. Appreciate you so much, brother. Thanks for the time today. Love you, Susie. Appreciate it. I pray you found some encouragement here today. Share it with a friend. The podcast will be up in less than an hour, and we will meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Susie Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You could become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.